Okay, I am live. I'm gonna have to move myself over to the uh, stove there. We got quite the operation set up. You'll see when I get there. And uh, hopefully you'll be able to hear me good enough when I get over to the stove. The mic does seem to work good enough for let me get over there and we'll get underway. Here we are. All right, can everybody hear me good? For some reason, I want to look up at the camera when I want to talk into the mic, but that's just a weird habit, I guess. What I'm doing today is making blackberry juice with my ancient Wagner. Pick this up, move it over here. My old Wagner uh, fruit and lard press. I got this for, what was that, 45 bucks I paid for that at a yard sale. And that was a hell of a good deal. Problem is, I have to really rethink my kitchen setup for filming because it just it's a real tough to get a decent camera angle. So I'm gonna have to prop this up on a pile of stuff once I get my berries cooked and get ready to start actually pressing them. It's gonna be kind of a teetery operation, but I think it'll work. And hopefully everything will go good and I don't end up with hot blackberry juice all over the place. Anyway. Wild blackberries usually start to ripen in June, July here in Wisconsin. They don't all ripen at once, so I picked a bunch of them over a period of a couple, three weeks. And I got, oh, probably about three quarts worth of berries. And I put them in the freezer. And I got them out now. And I put them on the stove, and I'm just getting them hot. They're just starting to boil. Berries are pretty soft, so I won't need to really cook them down to soften them up. Some things you need to soften pretty pretty good before you try cooking them. But these are plenty good. I'm going to turn my heat off. I'll just let these sit for a minute with the cover off. Get my lid out of the way. I'll just let these here sit off to the side. Hopefully I won't, won't steam my camera too much. Anyway, this, get this as close as I can to the burner without burning myself. This is my old Wagner fruit and lard press. It's made in three, several pieces. Inside you have this part here. That's what actually presses down on what you're pressing. Hopefully you can see that there's a patent date on there. Try and get to the camera. I'm not sure if you can see that, but it says patented August 20th, 1912 on there. And the way you can tell that this is a Wagner Ware is first by the design. They used to have on the outer part here, the outer part of the tubs, there used to be a big paper label on that. And you very seldom see them with the labels on them anymore because it was a paper label from over a hundred years ago. So they are pretty much all gone. Anyway, you have the base part, which has a spout on it, and it has a big threaded rod. They made a sausage stuffer attachment for this, which sat down on the base plate and it had a solid spout on it that you put sausage casing on and press sausages with it. But uh, you probably never find one of them either. They're out there somewhere, but someday maybe I will. Someday maybe I won't find one. Anyway, the Wagners were different than most other ones. Griswold made these. There are a bunch of other manufacturers that made fruit presses, lard presses, sausage stuffers. On all basically the same sort of design. Except the Wagner, the screw part was stationary. This is just fixed solidly to the base. On most of the other ones, the uh, base had kind of a yoke that came over the top. Once I put it all together here, you'll see that a little better. It had kind of a yoke that came over the top, and the handle stayed stationary, and it turned the screw up and down, and there was a presser foot on the bottom, and the screw pushed against the foot and pushed it down. On the Wagners, the screw stayed stationary. They also had this really cool hinged 
handle on it, which has a little latch on it, and it's threaded on the inside. I'll try and get the light so you can see that a little better. But it's threaded on the inside, and you can just put it around the screw wherever you need it to be to start pressing. Now the inside of this has a, another little sleeve that has holes in it, and they're fairly fine holes. But I want to get all the seeds out of these blackberries, and blackberries have lots of really fine, fine little seeds in them. So what I'm going to do is put my berries in these jelly bags, and then put the bags in the press, and press bags and all. They do make mesh bags for fruit presses, for tabletop fruit presses. You can still buy new ones, but I haven't found one that is quite right for this. Not quite the right size, not quite the right style for what I want. And they also are set up for ones that uh, the screw moves up and down and there's nothing sticking up through the bottom. I would have to cut a hole in the bottom of the bag and kind of stitch around it so it fit tightly around the stem of this screw without, uh, so it wouldn't leak around there. It would take a bit of doing. But anyway, let me get this thing set up so that I can actually start squeezing. I'm going to have to put it up on something to get it up high enough. Normally you would bolt this onto the edge of a table. It's got holes in the feet. I don't know if you can see that. It's got holes in the feet so you can bolt it down. But like I said, I got a stack of stuff here and a precarious kind of pile, but it should work out. There's my, there's my foot and my handle. Okay. Let me get this over here, and I'll put this under the spout to catch the juice. First of all, let me move my berries in nice and full so I ain't dripping everywhere. I'll fill up my jelly bags. Blackberries really stain things. Kind of incredible how much they will stain things. I don't want to overfill these because I'm going to be pressing them pretty tight. So I think that will do for that one. It's got a drawstring in it so I can just pull it up nice and tight, cinch it down good, and probably wrap it around there. Fighting me. There, give that a little twist. There we go. Wrap my strings around. Come on, you. Wrap the other string around the other way. And give them a tie. And I'll put this right in the press. And we'll fill up the other one. These really smell nice. I don't, I want, I'm going to make jelly, blackberry jelly out of this. And I don't really have time to do that tonight. But more importantly, I've lost my damn recipe. It's around somewhere. But I couldn't lay hands on it this week. But hopefully I'll be able to find it and uh, make a video this weekend of making the juice. Let's scrape these last few out. That's all of them. I'm going to ladle out of the way. bag. It's kind of hard to do this with the hot juice, so bear with me. There. 
and to put him on the other side. Now I'll put my foot on there. For some reason that foot is kind of a pain on this. It'll drop right in. There we go. You got to hit it just right in that center piece to get it to go in. Now we get this face in the right direction. Clamp it on a little bit above there and tighten her down. One thing about pressing things, whether you're using a tabletop press like this or a big apple cider press, you want to do it fairly slow. You'll get a big rush of juice at first. You get it tightened up a bit. You want to let it run. Just let the uh, juice press out slowly and you get your best you get the most juice out of it that way. Hopefully you can see the juice running out of there now. And it slowed down so I'll give her a little bit more squeeze. I should get enough juice for a nice batch of blackberry jelly out of this. Because I, I remember the recipe called for either four cups or eight cups of fruit and I had more than that and then you juice it up and you make your jelly out of it. Let me grab a spoon quick. Let me give this a little taste. Mm, that is nummy. down and let her sit some more. Anyway, let me grab some other stuff here quick. I'll show you some of the things I got over the course of the week. I can't really see your can't really see your comments. I'm over there. Let me come back here. I'll flip through them quick if there's anything. Hey Grampy, good to see ya. Money Pit Homestead. Uh, what am I making? I'm making blackberry juice. Where's ours? Yeah, go out and pick your own berries. It's a little bit past berry picking time, so. Angie, you made it. Nice to see you. Prairie Queen, Ron Thompson. Let's see. I'm right by the mic, so you'll be able to hear me good now. Anyway, I'll get back to my comments here. But while this is squeezing out, I can show you some of my acquisitions for the week. Give this a little tightening down. And give it some time to run. Anyway, mostly what I found was little bacon dishes. I found a parts pan for four dollars and uh, what brand is that? I'm not sure. I think that's a Philippe Richard. It's a French name but it's made in China. It's a nice little pan. It's pretty decent quality iron. And you make little heart-shaped cakes with that. This is kind of interesting. This is a Wagner Ware Junior size corn stick pan and it says made in USA so this is made after about 1962-63 but the Wagner Ware logo, let's see if I can get you on camera good, it's way up here in the corner. Usually they were down on one of the middle couple of corn cobs kind of in the middle and that's the first time I've seen it way up there in the corner you know I've seen it on one end but it was centered it's just a little unusual and I thought it was kind of cool and for what was that four dollars couldn't go wrong I found this little guy for three bucks that's a little tiny 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 corn stick pan 
not marked, but I'm pretty sure it's made in China. But that's nice iron too. That's pretty decent quality. And comparing it to the size of the other one, you can see just how much smaller that one is. They did make both Griswold and Wagner. I think Lodge does too. They did make what they call a T-size corn stick pan. And uh, they're a little bit bigger than that little one. But they're a lot smaller than the uh, regular junior size. And uh, they go for pretty good money if you can find them. They're kind of scarce. Tighten this down. Get it running again. And you can feel when you uh, tighten it down after you leave it sit for a while, it loosens up a little bit. You know, it's fairly snug right now. But after this sits for a few minutes, it'll kind of relax as everything presses out. And it will, uh, you know, get another back up on the pressing. And looking at this, I got, well, it's probably about three cups worth of juice, four maybe. I think it calls for four. But it's also pretty, pretty strong. There's no water in this. This is just straight juice. So if I have to uh, add a little bit of water, just dilute it a tiny bit. Get it to get it up to what I need for my recipe. I should be okay. I think it takes three or four cups. I can't remember. Anyhow, kind of muttering. I keep remembering to speak up because I'm way away from the microphone. Hopefully, I'm not muttering too much. But anyway, it's got a couple of more squeezes left in it before we do anything. So. I'm going to move the camera back over to the computer and sit down and talk to you. But that's my fancy fancy little antique press in action. Let me cover the lens so you don't get vertigo when I go swinging and moving all my furniture around. Okay, I gotta move the camera stand, swing the camera. Gotta lower the camera, that's what I'm forgetting to do. Move that out of the way. Kick some things around. Frighten the dog a little bit. No, I'm not going to hit you, Milo. You're a little close, but you're not that close. Why are you fighting me? There we go. That's not where it belongs. Muttering to myself as I Try and rearrange and reorganize here. Try not to hit things with the camera or the boom. That should be about right. Uh, gotta turn off this light overhead. Gotta move this out of the way. And while I'm over here, I'll give her another tightening down. Okay. Now we should be just about ready. Eek, there I am. Yeah, my camera's sitting a little cockeyed, but I guess we can live with that. Make it up just a little bit higher. Uh, stay, stay. Not you, Milo. Okay. Get the mic out of the way. All right, now we're ready to go. Nope, can't quite see it. And we'll back up to the 
start of the comments here so I can catch up, say hi to everybody, make sure I get everybody this time around. Ron Thompson, nice to see you. Shinudo 145, yeah, you were on time this time. Uh, sounds good. Love the clickbait title. JD, give it for John. That's no, not exactly clickbait. It was a pressing matter with my press. And I keep hitting my stand. Mennonite Farmhouse, good to see you. Prairie Queen. Yeah, Angie, I said hi to you. Uh, Billy Lee, good to see Billy Lee always around. Carolyn Bandroff, yeah, that darn recipe. I got a couple of different blackberry jelly recipes. I can't find the damn things anywhere. They're not, uh, they're written down, tucked in my canning book, and they're not. So, but they'll turn up shortly, I'm sure. Uh, said hi to Grampy Lobster, Money Pit Homestead. I uh, just jumped in. I was squeezing blackberry juice. Blackberry wine. Nope, that's going to be jelly. I need to. Looks like a torture device. Yeah, that would uh, that would definitely put some hurting on you. Stuck a finger under there and squeezed her down. Uh, the hearts pan. Yeah, that's kind of a cute little pan. And you know, like what was that? Four bucks for that one. You know, four bucks. Can't hardly pass it up. You got a thyroid tumor. Well, that ain't good. You shouldn't have those. You know, I, you know, personally, I try to avoid having thyroid tumors. But I suppose if you get one, you get one. Uh, find out more Monday. Finally get to binge watch me. Hey, all right. You won't have to work. Oh, well, I hope it turns out good for you. And I think I've just about caught up. Uh, Ron Thompson missed the last two weeks. And yeah, there we are. Got everybody all caught up. Yeah, that should be enough juice. You even have to dilute it just a little bit. It's uh, pretty strong, so it tastes good. I mean, blackberries are my favorites. I mean, they're just fantastic tasting little things. And uh, even if I got to water it down just to bring it up to, uh, I think it's four cups is what I need. I got probably three there at least. And uh, I'll put her in the fridge until this weekend. I'll find that find that recipe. And uh, my eye is sticky. Ah, something in there. I'll find that recipe and I'll probably do a video making you know making the jelly this weekend. I uh, love the latest video. Oh, thank you. And uh, yeah, I'll get that. Uh, you know, probably do that this weekend. Yeah, I just didn't have time to get everything set up, and even so, you know, taken. Taking too long to do it in an hour, or even probably two by the time I get done messing around with everything. So uh, I don't want to go that long. But anyway, yeah, I got to really rethink my kitchen setup here for trying to film around it. Because uh, it was really hard to uh, get a decent angle where you could see anything at all over there. It works out okay with my other camera, my regular video camera, because I can just move the camera where it needs to be. But with this, you know, it's corded and it's plugged into the computer and I only got so much cord. So if I move some things around, move the computer, kind of rearrange some some of my stuff here, I should be able to get something where I can, uh, you know, get a lot better camera angles. Even if I'm using my other camera, you know, it'd be a little bit easier to get at. Uh, have I tried that sausage skillet sausage recipe I sent you? No, I haven't got around trying it, but I saw it and, uh, it's on my many things to do list. Blackberry brandy? No, I don't have quite that many, but uh, I got a little patch along the edge of my driveway, you know, pretty much where I gave up mowing and the uh, blackberries took over. Because around here, pretty much any open spot in the woods, you know, if you go out uh, logging and uh, thin out the trees enough, you'll get tons and tons of blackberry brush in there and uh, popple slashings. The popple trees come back real fast. So, uh, yeah, it's kind of a pain deer hunting, trying to tromp through the thorn brush, but they do make real nice berries. I have some raspberries, too. They come on a lot later than the blackberries do, but uh, there ain't nearly as many of them. And I'm not, I like, uh, 
you know, I like raspberries, but not nearly as much as blackberries. You know, to me, the raspberries have kind of a saccharine aftertaste. I don't know why. A little red bush, yeah. Actually, that's Mountain Dew Baja Blast. It was on sale, so I figured I'd give it a try. Do I like Culver's? Yeah, Culver's got some pretty good stuff. They make a uh, make a nice Reuben sandwich, and uh, you know their burgers are good. You know they're probably one of the better better fast food joints around, and they've really taken off the last five or six years. They've really expanded across the country. They used to be just a uh, you know, Wisconsin, Minnesota, Iowa type of thing. I think the first one I came across was probably 20 years ago down in uh, Viroqua, Wisconsin. Kind of in the uh, you know, southwestern corner of the state. Not all the way to the southwestern corner, but it's it's down there quite a ways. And, uh, and, and uh, yeah, I mean, they've been growing ever since. I uh, have blackberries everywhere in Louisiana. Just have to watch out for snakes. Yeah, I bet. You know, we got we have snakes around here too, but uh, the only poisonous ones we have are uh, timber rattlers. They're mostly down in the bluff country along the Mississippi. There's a few around here, but they're pretty pretty rare to see timber rattlers. They like a lot more rocky kind of country, and uh, you see a water moccasins now and then down in the Mississippi, and. Uh, some you know little some some ways up some of the rivers that uh empty into the mississippi jimmy langford hi mud hope everyone's well yeah yeah should be heading back to some cold temps soon never lived in those temps before always been in texas well you had a little bit of a little bit of cool weather here last winter in texas should be heading back yeah i gotta start getting ready i gotta start cutting wood because uh it's always too damn hot and humid to do it in the summer. Go out there and start hacking away at the wood pile. And of course, this time of year, you got to hurry up and get her all done as fast as you can because winter can start anywhere from now until the first part of December. So you really want to try and have your wood pretty well done by end of September, you know, into October. Well, it never does quite work out that way. I'm usually still cutting a little bit of wood into November just to, uh, Fill up the trailer. I got a big hay wagon that I put a, uh, it's a carport tent, you know, if you ever seen those. And I put tarps around the side for it. So it's basically a covered wagon. And uh, get that loaded up as much as you'll hold. That'll get me through the winter usually. But it seems like you always end up running about three weeks short on your wood. The last couple, three weeks, you're scrounging bits and pieces just to get enough of a fire going to take the chill off because it's warm enough that you don't need a fire going all the time but it's still cold enough that you need a fire going some of the time but yeah that must have been quite the uh quite the experience of texas getting down into the single digits around zero for a few days you know especially you're not not at all set up for that kind of thing you know, with all the, uh, uh, Miss Woodfire have a furnace in the trailer, so it's not the same. No, I mean, nothing really heats like, you know, my nose itches has been insulating for the past week or so. Uh, nothing really heats like wood. I mean, you got a big steel box full of fire, you know, and it's just massive radiant heat from it. And, you know, nothing really feels like it. You know, I mean, uh, you know, electric heat or gas heat or even radiant floor heat. It, it's just not the same and once you get used to it i mean you just you miss it once you don't have it it'd be kind of a pain sometimes if it's not as cold as you think it is or get a real still night real still and real cold but there's no real wind to uh cool the house off i mean i've had to open windows when it's 20 below outside because the stove just took off and went wild on me uh, do I ever grill out? What style of grill do I use? Yeah, I grill out now and then. Not as much as I used to, but uh, I have a smoker smoker grill. 
with the, uh, you know, it's got the firebox on the side and the big smoker chamber on, you know, above it. Well, not above it, kind of, you know, to the side and above. And uh, you use charcoal or wood in it. And uh, I usually use cherry wood in it. I'll get the fire going with, uh, you know, maybe a fourth of a bag, half a bag of charcoal. Get that going good and then start feeding that uh, cherry wood because we got cherry trees around here. You know, wild cherries are pretty common. You know, there's usually one that's dropped a big branch or something. So, you know, I usually pick up cherry or maple or even oak works good too. Got a nice number 12 large logo Griswold off Marketplace in the lie tank now. Said he bought it at a yard sale for two dollars. <laughs> you know, wish you could luck up like that. Yeah, every once in a while, you know, I mean, you still find. I still find pretty good stuff for next to nothing. Yeah, I mean, I found some amazingly cheap things. You know, a lot of times it's something that's deeply encrusted and you can't tell what it is. You know, five bucks, ten bucks, even twenty. You know, it might be worth a chance if you recognize it as being an old, an old skillet. And uh, Griswold, if you can see the number on the handle, they have a pretty distinctive style of font. So even if you can't see the logo, but if you can see the number. You can usually tell by the style of the uh, the style of the number on there that it's a Griswold of one type or another. Which yeah, I mean you, you you keep looking. I mean it is luck and perseverance. You know, like I I found that little uh, slant logo griddle a couple of weeks ago at a Goodwill for six dollars, and uh, you know, I mean that's something that normally sells for fifty or sixty. So it's just a matter of uh you know, being there when it's there. Yeah, you know, I usually get to town once a week and uh, I'll make a trip through. There's, well, three or four secondhand shops in the area. And I'll usually make kind of a circuit around there when I do it in my grocery shop and then all the other running I usually have to do on the weekend. So, you know, sometimes you find something and, you know, a lot of times there's nothing there or nothing that you'd be interested in. But every once in a while, you find some really nice stuff. Yeah, if people don't know how to drive, we get kind of any kind of ice or snow in Texas. Yeah, I bet. Uh, even the first couple of times you get a good snow or ice storm around here, people forget how to drive on the ice over the summer. And, uh, you know, it's comical. I mean, it's a pain if you have to go out in it. But it can be kind of comical because there's people sliding in the ditch left and right and tons of little fender benders and parking lots and whatnot. And, you know, it usually takes a couple of good snowstorms and people figure it out again and get the hang of it. Uh, number 12 with a heat ring, too. Yeah, I think number 12 and bigger, Griswolds all had heat rings, even the uh, even the small logo ones. You know, the kind of, Griswold kind of moved away from the heat rings fairly early on, like about uh, 1912 or so. They never entirely phased them out, but... Uh, they went more to the smooth bottom and kind of promoted that and they sold better, you know, especially after, you know, 1930 or so when gas and electric stoves really started taking over. But their, uh, their biggest sizes, you know, number 12, I think it was, and up, I know for sure, bigger than 12s, all had heat rings. And, uh, but they did, st they did still keep making skillets with heat rings, smaller ones up until about 1940 when they switched over to the uh, small logo and then they did away with the heat rings on the smaller skillets entirely because I've got a number eight or number nine large logo skillet with a heat ring on it so yeah yeah the uh, like I said all the really the really big lodge or lodge Griswold skillets had heat rings on them Uh, heating oil is good. Yeah, heating oil, you know, has a different kind of feel to it than gas or electric or whatnot. I don't know exactly why it does, but it does. But I still like, still prefer wood. You know, I mean, I've burned wood pretty much my entire life, so I'm used to it. Nothing else really feels right. Although there are times when it would be nice to have a gas furnish, something you just crank up the thermostat and not have to mess around with it. But it's worthwhile and it's a hell of a lot cheaper. You know what I mean?
propane prices being what they are. Even in, what I usually do is uh, I'll buy a truckload of logs, you know, basically a semi load. Costs around, kind of depending on what it's going for any given year. It'll cost uh, anywhere from nine to eleven hundred dollars, and that's enough wood for two and a half, three years. So, you know, basically paying three hundred dollars a year for heat around here is a hell of a good price. But it takes a lot of work. You gotta cut it up, split it, load it, haul it, move it around, bring it in, set it on fire. So, you know, it's three hundred dollars out laying probably another $300 worth of labor into it easily. Yeah, I have an oil stove and a wood stove both. Yeah, that's, you know, kind of the way to go. You know, because you can set your furnace low so it kicks in when your fire burns out in the wee hours of the morning. And it's not so cold in the house when you get up. But this place is pretty well, pretty well built and pretty well insulated. So, uh, even as drafty as it is, you know, it's still fairly well insulated. It's kind of weird. But, uh, you know, it still manages to draw air through enough little cracks and crevices around. Which is probably for the best. You don't have to worry so much about carbon monoxide if you got a breeze blowing through your living room. Oh, uh, you like cutting wood? Well, okay. I don't mind it, you know, but it's definitely not something I want to do during the summertime although I have been once in a while I have gotten roped into usually it's helping somebody else clean up down trees and things like that and you end up uh figuring, well we might as well cut her up and split her up and get it stacked so it dries you end up busting your ass and well the neighbor says he's got a couple of trees down too that I can have just go over and get them you end up cutting and hauling and Putting up more wood for your friend than you do for yourself. Yeah, the farmhouse you had was fucking cold. Yeah, a lot of them old farmhouses, they weren't uh, terribly well insulated either. You know, especially, you know, really old farmhouses, they weren't insulated at all. Sometimes the best you'd find is if you tore open a wall doing something, you'd find it was stuffed with newspapers. I've seen that a couple of times. And uh, the guy I used to work with, his dad had an old farmhouse, and they're going to put a addition on it, and they had to cut out a section of the wall, and they started tearing into it. And the way the place had been built, they took rough cut oak two by eights, and they stacked them flat on top of each other, and kind of did a log cabin style corner, spiked it all together, and just plastered over them, so it was a solid wood wall on the outside. And he said they had just a hell of a time trying to cut through that with the chainsaw, you know, full of nails and big old spikes. And that wood was so old, so dried out and hard, they just fried chains left and right on it trying to get that wall opened up. But he said, you know, it was pretty cool. And I guess it wasn't really all that uncommon, you know, if you had a lot of land to clear a hundred years ago, just, uh, you know, cut them up, haul them over to a sawmill, have them sawed into lumber, and just uh, stack them up like a log cabin made out of boards. It was a pretty slick deal. Oh yeah, I suppose you got a lot of trees that you need to get out of the way and stuff down in the woods too. But if you know, it, get her all stacked up good, even if it's just logs, you know, that'll last you for fire for a couple, three years anyway. Of course, you got to find somewhere that's out of the way, which is never, never happens when you're building because you need room for something else. So you got a pile of logs in the damn way. So, you know, you're trying to work around that and never really, really works out. But of course, three or four years from now, you'd be thinking, you know, damn, I wish we would have kept all that wood. Probably hard to ask for. No, it was, it was, uh, can't remember if it was red, red oak or white oak, you know, but it was, uh, it was oak, oak boards. Oh, uh, yeah, 
have all poplar, so you're saving it, but it doesn't burn too hot. Well, you know, when it's dry, poplar burns pretty good. You know, it uh, burns fast. You know, the biggest problem with it is it burns really fast and uh, it leaves a lot of ash if you burn quite a bit of it. And uh, it's good for starting a fire in the morning. You get your fire going, you throw in a, throw in a few chunks of poplar, you get some fast heat out of it. And you get coals right away and you can start feeding it a little better wood. But, uh, you know, I've done it, burn popple full time for heat and you got to stoke it constantly. And like I said, it makes, you end up with twice as much ash as you threw in wood sometimes with that stuff, it seems like. Yeah, and it doesn't hold the fire very long. It'll burn, burn down pretty quick. You know, but it is entirely useless. Yeah, so you're out here mostly, I get uh, it's mixed hardwood. It's mostly uh, oak and maple. There's uh, one guy that does his own log and makes his own uh, hardwood flooring. He's got a mill and he dries out and that. And, uh, you know, he sells firewood. You know, the stuff they sell for firewood is mostly big limbs. You know, sometimes they get, you know, good sized logs, but they got, you know, they're too split up and cracked or something like that to make decent lumber out of them. Uh, still in the box, I had a Wagner's cast iron cookware 100 year celebration set, limited five piece miniature cookware set. Is it worth anything? Uh, a few people are starting to collect the uh, you know, the Wagner AK 91s, you know, but the five the miniature, mini, uh, complete miniature cookware set, yeah, that probably would be worth something, but I couldn't begin to guess how much, you know, but it would be uh. You know, it'd be something worth hanging on to, you know, you know, a complete set like that of the miniatures, you know, just the uh, skillets, you know, they usually sell 10, 15 bucks. I see, you know, a lot of people seem to think that it says 1891 on it means it's actually made in 1891, which of course it wasn't, it was made in the 1990s. And, uh, you know, I see them asking 40, 50, 60 bucks a piece for these pans and, uh, you know, they're just not worth it. You know, the... The really big ones, they did make, you know, some like 14 inch skillets, you know, but even those are worth, you know, 25, 30 because they're really big, but mostly the skillets are worth 10 to 15. But like I said, I don't know what the, uh, the miniature set would be worth and, uh, you know, something to hang on to. Use dry mulberry fire starter. Yeah, it would work pretty good, you know, at least for starting. And there's always dead limbs on mulberry trees. I mean, they, they really drop a lot of, lot of, uh, branches. You got to trim the damn things constantly. I got four or five of them outside and, uh, they're kind of nice. I mean, I like mulberries, but I can almost never beat the birds to them because they don't have, they have very little flavor to them until they're completely ripe and the birds will sit there and I swear they'll watch the berries until they're just right and then they'll nab them before I get a chance to get them. But uh, you can just uh, spread sheets out underneath the trees and give it a gentle shake because when mulberries are ripe, I mean, you just barely touch them and they'll fall right off. So you could just shake them out of the tree. But of course, you gotta get ambitious enough to go out and actually do that when the uh, mulberries are on. And I've noticed that they're kind of, the trees alternate. You know, two or three of them will be bearing real heavy one year and the other ones will have hardly any on them then the next year the ones that were bearing heavy will have very few and the ones that weren't will have tons and tons of mulberries on them kind of neat Anyway, yeah, that little, uh, that little tiny corn stick pan, that was kind of cute, so I grabbed that. I'm not really sure what, uh, what, uh, 
you know, what, who made it. I mean, I'm pretty sure it's Chinese, but, you know, it's nice, nice iron on it, so it should be worth something worthwhile once you get it cleaned up. It'd be kind of fun to play with, you know, just a cute little thing like that. I would like to find a, you know, Wagner Ware T-sized one. I've seen a couple of them around, but, you know, they wanted 60, 70 bucks for them, you know, which was way more than I'd be willing to pay for it. But even so, they are, they are quite a bit more expensive than the, uh, you know, the common junior sized ones. So that'll probably be the only T size one I have for a while, unless I get lucky and find one cheap somewhere. Uh, that's how pecan trees are. Yeah. And, uh, some breeds of apples are like that too. You know, they, uh, the trees will go every other year with their apples to be real heavy one year and hardly anything the next. And mostly the, uh, you know, older heirloom varieties, because they kind of bred that out for, you know, commercial trees, because of course you want apples every year if you're going to be growing apples for a living. They don't produce good everywhere. I wouldn't suppose, you know, we don't have any of them up here at all, so they wouldn't produce much of anything in Wisconsin. But I do like pecans. They're, good. They're pretty good. A lot of oak trees are like that too with their acorns. You know, they kind of alternate years for acorn production. <laughs> now the wild apples bloomed up there. Dozens of trees just bare. Hmm. Yeah, I didn't really get a, now that I think of it, I didn't get, uh, didn't get much for flowering for apples around here either. Do I know of any Glendale cast iron pans for Glendale uh, wood cook stove? No, I don't. I haven't, uh, I haven't heard of Glendale. There might be some, but uh, I haven't heard of Glendale, Glendale stoves either. So, but uh, you know, a lot of stove makers did make make uh, you know cast iron cookware. You know, usually a skillet and kettle and Dutch oven. But uh, most of them didn't mark it. You know, they just uh, put a size number on it and they sold it along with the stove. But very few of them, uh, very few of them actually, actually marked their, uh, their cast iron hollow air. Ash, walnut, and mulberry is your main wood source. Yeah, walnut burns good, but, you know, it's pretty expensive for firewood and usually even fairly small pieces. You can, uh, you can sell for, you know, you can get, uh, you know, lumber yard, you know, lumber mills will still buy even fairly small walnut, but you're still going to have some limbs and stuff like that left over. So if you got a lot of walnut trees, your black walnut especially, you've got a lot of walnut trees around in your area that are being cut. You know, it makes real good firewood, holds fire real well. So does ash. Ash is pretty, pretty similar to oak as far as burning goes. There's a pest going around Wisconsin, the emerald ash borer, borer <coughs> which is uh, killing off a lot of ash trees. So there's going to be quite a bit of ash firewood. The problem is most counties, they won't let you take it out of the county that it's in because they don't want to spread, spread the bugs around any more than they already have. Some invasive pest that got imported on a pallet from some, somewhere else, like Dutch elm disease, that was from, you know, in Holland, the Netherlands, Europe, and that came over on, you know, this load of lumber that had, had the, uh, insects on it which it's actually a fungus that uh makes dutch elm disease but the insects carry the fungus and the fungus kills the trees i guess they've been having a hell of a time with uh a lot of garden plants ornamental flowers and stuff that 
once they escape your garden, they're invasive as hell. And a lot of people never think about that. And even a lot of, uh, a lot of greenhouses and garden centers are unaware that, you know, some of these plants you really shouldn't be selling because once they get out of somebody's garden, they just take over, you know, like kudzu. There's a couple other vines that have just gone hog wild down south, I guess. You know, around here, there's some lake weeds, which are really causing problems with the, uh, causing problems with the uh, lakes because they end up choking out all the native weeds and nothing eats them. So pretty soon you got just a big lake full of, full of weeds and nothing else in it. I had a beetle take out a lot of pines in New England. Yeah, uh, I think I heard about that. You know, some type of, You know, some type of beetle. It's the same sort of thing with the ash trees. It's a little little green beetle kind of thing. Burrows into the bark of the tree and causes them. I'm not sure if the if the uh, bug itself is what actually kills the tree or if it's uh, some kind of fungus or disease that the bug carries that does. But I've had a... I've got some elm trees here that have grown back since the Dutch elm came through. And... Uh, you know, for a while they come up and they die, and they come up and they die. So I think we have a a bit of a resistant strain going around here. It's kind of nice to see. I mean, hopefully they'll propagate out a little bit more because uh, you know, there just ain't many elm trees around anymore. Uh, you got the gypsy moths invading us this year. Yeah, we got them around here too. They uh, spray for them every spring, but it's not really a <clears throat> it's not really a spray. It's little, little tiny, tiny pellets of plastic that are soaked in uh, moth pheromones. And it confuses the moths with all these pheromones floating around. They can't find a mate. And because uh, only once they're adults, they only have a few days. I forget how long the lifespan of an adult gypsy moth is. But it isn't terribly bad. So they, uh, you know, as long as they can keep them from mating too much really cuts down on the population. Yeah, I had two ash trees died from that. Yeah, yeah I mean, uh, it's, you know, getting pretty widespread in Wisconsin. You know, I think there's a few counties that still don't have, uh, have the ash borers, but not very many. I mean, it's pretty much, pretty much spread statewide now. Uh, the mayflies are bad there. Yeah, it's, uh, you know, sometimes you get the conditions just right for a certain kind of bug, they'll just run wild. We had uh, real bad deer flies this this spring and summer. And uh, the mosquitoes weren't bad, but the uh, the deer flies are just terrible. You go outside, damn things drag you off. Oh, I also, I forgot, I got the orifices for my little gas stove back there. I haven't got a chance to put them in yet, but I should be able to do that later on tonight. Get them going. And see uh, see if that does the cure. It should. I'd like to think so. Because uh, I looked at them compared to the other ones. They're quite a bit smaller. Smaller hole in them. So it should, should uh, settle things down. Get it going pretty good. Love the press. Yeah, that was a hell of a good find. Like I say, you know, you can tell it's a Wagner. You know, I, I kind of thought it was, you know, when I saw the patent date, just that kind of style of writing is what, you know, is the, uh, is the kind of font that Wagner generally used around 1910, 1912. But did a little search around and, you know, figure it out for sure. It's definitely a Wagner ware. But like I say, the, uh, you know, originally it just had a big paper label on it, which is kind of silly. So, uh. You know, because it's going to get washed even if you don't, uh, you know, even if you uh, try to preserve the label on it, it's going to get washed after you use it, so the label is going to fall off right away. I've uh, seen a few scotch bowls for sale, but not sure what they're, what you'd use it for. They're kind of different. Yeah, I got a couple of them too. And uh, I think you could use like a small wok. It would probably be 
one good use for them. You know, if you just wanted to make a uh, little stir fry for one or two people, it'd probably work out pretty slick for something like that. You know, in fact, I'll probably I'll give that a try once I get the wood stove going again, so I can set it right down in the right down in the fire and get her good and toasty hot. Yeah, you got the Emerald Dashboard everywhere in Iowa. Yeah, I mean, once, you know, it's really hard to stop the spread of pretty much any kind of bug like that once they get established. <clears throat> but yeah, and Scotch Bowls are pretty nice, you know, and, uh, you know, like I said, you know, they could, you know, they definitely work for a, uh, for a small walk. And mostly you're used for making, you know, soup and broth and things like that, where you just set it on the back of your stove and, let it slowly simmer away. You know, there's a couple other other styles of kettle and things like that. You know, they got real specific shapes for them, and you wouldn't, you know, you kind of wonder sometimes, you know, why exactly they were designed like that. But a lot, you know, it's it's part of the real cool stuff that's out there for cast iron. If you uh, look around, get lucky, and find some of it. But yeah, that press really, really did work out nice. And that juice is, like I said, it's pretty concentrated, so I think I can get away with watering it down a little bit if I have to. But I'm not sure if I do. You know, I'll see exactly how much I get, measure it up, and uh, make the jelly this weekend. So I should be able to do a video for that. Uh, hi, Tall Cedars. Good to see you. Uh, have you ever used a lodge fire stand to cook in a campfire? No. You know, I mean, I've seen, I can't remember if I've seen one or not. I've seen the, you know, a lot of the lodge, you know, their little, uh, oh, what they call it, sportsman grill. It's like a cast iron kind of a, it's not really a hibachi grill, but it's something, something along those lines. But I don't think I've seen the, uh, you know, the uh, regular stands, you know, for putting in a campfire. Maybe we're some something worth looking into, because I got plenty enough of uh, the stuff that has a bale on it that's made to be hung over a fire. So if I had one, I would definitely have the stuff to use on it. Yeah, Billy, are you gonna call it a day? Well, take care, and we'll see you next week. And since she's calling it a day, that reminds me, it's almost an hour is up. Our hour is just about up here, so everybody's going to take off, so I think I will too. Uh, Angie, you're leaving too. Good to see you. Always nice to hear from you guys, and hope your house is going well. You should hope your well is going well. Got an old Wagner flat bottom kettle, and bottom has to be almost a half inch thick. Yeah, some of the uh, you know flat bottom stuff, they you know put a real heavy bottom on it. You know, I don't, you know, sometimes it's not as heavy as, uh, some of them are heavier than others, I guess is what I'm trying to say. I'm not sure if it was deliberately designed that way or if they just, you know, had differences in the, uh, the patterns and the mold when they made them. You know, but every once in a while you'll find something that's unusually thick. Oh, well, coming in October. Well, October ain't all that far away, so that would be good for you. Always nice to have water. Oh, it's nice for frying. Yeah, I bet it is. You know, probably takes a bit longer to heat up, but once you got it hot, it's going to stay that way. Anyway, it's been dog underfoot finally. Anyway, it's been good to see you all, and I uh, hope you enjoyed the little press show there. Yeah, those are kind of nice. I mean, there's a lot of different brands out there. You know, you know, there's both Wagner and Griswold made some. And there's tons of other brands, so uh, if you're looking for one, you should be able to find one fairly easy. They're kind of expensive. You know, a lot of the older ones are getting up around 100 bucks or better for, uh, you know, for a vintage one. But you can still find them every now and then fairly reasonable. And uh, as you can see, that worked out pretty good. And uh, like I said, I'm going to try and find a decent mesh bag that will work for it. And... Uh, because it doesn't need to be quite as fine as those jelly bags. But I want something fine enough to catch 
blackberry seeds. And I'll see you guys next week. And hopefully by then I'll have my little gas burner going again. We can play around with that maybe. That'll make for a nice show. Fiddling around with that and seeing how it's going to go. Pretty sure the orifices will do it. And uh, if it doesn't, I'll have to think of what else. I don't know why it wouldn't. But anyway, see you all next week. Hit the like button on your way out. If you like what you see, subscribe. If you feel like it, go ahead and join the channel for all kinds of wonderful things. And I'll see you guys next week.